All right, good morning. My name is Katie Wattis Talkin, and I am the chair for the Committee on the Status of Women. Welcome to the 35th annual Mary Lucretia and Sarah Emily Creighton Awards Luncheon. We are thrilled to be celebrating 35 years of this award. Thank you for joining us. As you were entering, I hope you noticed the portrait of Mary Lucretia Creighton in the hallway. Special thanks to archivist David Crawford for bringing this display to us today. The portrait is on, is on permanent display in the Rare Books Room in the Reiner Alumni Library. Our purpose at this signature event is to celebrate the legacy left to us by our female founders, the Wareham sisters, Mary Lucretia and Sarah Emily. Theirs is a legacy that has inspired generations and has led to the Creighton University we know today. From the days of Mary Lucretia driving her horse and carriage through the streets of Omaha to help the poor, to Sarah Emily's help in establishing St. John's Church and St. Joseph's Hospital, these women laid the foundation for our university. Female students attended Creighton as early as 1892 and have contributed to the university ever since. With Mary Lucretia and Sarah Emily Wareham Creighton in mind, today we celebrate three people on our campus who continue the legacy of the Wareham sisters. Our honorees today are Megan Bullard, Arts and Sciences Junior, Dr. Diane Cullen, Professor of Biomedical Sciences, and Coach Jim Flannery, Head Coach of the Women's Basketball Team. At this time, I would like to introduce Colette O'Mara McKinney, Associate Vice, Associate Vice President for the, to the President, and 2001 Mary Lucretia and Sarah Emily Creighton Award honoree to offer a welcoming address. Colette. Thank you, Katie. I have such a long name, but I could be at the podium by the time she finished introducing me. It's my pleasure to formally welcome you to the 35th Annual Awards Luncheon. I offer a special welcome to our alumni and past recipients who were able to join us today. This is truly one of my personal favorite events of Founders Week, and I love Founders Week. I'm tired, as many of you probably are, but I love this week because it's a reminder for me. You know, when this award was created 35 years ago, it was somewhat visionary. It was certainly groundbreaking at the time, and it perfectly reflects the solid foundation Mary Lucretia laid for this university when she willed $100,000 to start Creighton College upon her passing in 1876. Two years later, her sister and brother-in-law, it was a family affair, Sarah Emily and John Creighton made this bequest a reality. And every year, generation after generation, colleagues and students have given of themselves to make this institution one of the greatest in this nation. It's very inspirational and it's also humbling and it serves as a reminder of how fortunate each one of us really are, how blessed we are to be a part of something that is so bigger, so much bigger than our individual selves, and yet knowing that each one of us make a contribution to this university, to our students, in helping change the lives of those around us and really the Creighton of tomorrow. So I offer special congratulations to our honorees this year, Megan, Diane, and Jim. Thank you for everything you've done for Creighton University to uplift the women on this campus. You have set the bar very high for all of us. Once again, thank you for attending this fine event and congratulations to our honorees. Thank you, Colette. As we prepare for our meal and the program to recognize our honorees, I would like to invite Dr. Eileen Burke Sullivan, Vice Provost for Mission and Ministry, to come forward for the invocation. Following the invocation, I invite you to enjoy your meal. Our program will continue following lunch. Dr. Burke Sullivan. Thank you, it's a, a great honor to be invited to uh, lead us in prayer. And in, before I do so, I'd like to just read a short reflective passage from the General Congregation of the Society of Jesus just 20 years ago. It ended just 20 years ago this month. And their, uh, 
The fourth decree is specifically on Jesuits and the situation of women. I love the title. <laughs> <clears throat> But in the conclusion of that passage, or that text, a very important text, by the way, to the work of the Society of Jesus worldwide, and here at Creighton, I believe, as well, the, the Jesuits stated, the society gives thanks for all that has already been achieved through the often costly struggle for a, must just re for a more just relationship between women and men. We thank women for the lead that they have given and continue to give. And then they go on to say, above all, we want to commit the society in a more formal and explicit way to regard this solidarity with women as integral to our mission. In this way, we hope that the whole society will regard this work for reconciliation between women and men in all of its forms as integral to the interpretation of, degree, of Decree 4 of GC 32 which is the congregation that established the uh, service of faith is accomplished in the service of justice. So we know that a reflective and sustained commitment to bring about this respectful reconciliation can flow only from our God of love and justice, who reconciles all and promises a world in which there is no Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, and there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. So I invite us to take a moment now and pray that indeed God will continue to bless this campus and all who serve it. We ask especially that God will bless the Cretans. We ask in a very special way too that God will bless us, that as we continue to work on behalf of all of humanity, for justice and peace, that we will never neglect the least or the poorest or those on the margins in any way. And we ask this as we pray a blessing. Bless us, O Lord, and these your gifts, which we are about to receive from your bounty. Through Christ our Lord, amen. Thank you. Each year at this luncheon, we'd like to offer a bit of history and information about the Committee on the Status, status of Women's recent accomplishments. I would like to invite Leanne Christ, Vice Chair for the Committee, to come forward to share a few remarks. Leanne. Thank you, Katie. The Committee on the Status of Women was established in 1971 to ensure equal consideration for women in all phases of university operations and to encourage the contributions of women in carrying out the mission of Creighton. Since that time, the committee has broadened its focus to include the advancement of women, um, recognizing that the unique talents and perspectives of men and women to drive our success at, as an organization. Over this past year, our committee has been focused on maintaining high quality programming, as well as researching what key issues the committee should be focusing on for the next year. We have held various personal and professional development events, particularly focusing on networking and mentoring. Last summer, we had a very successful speed mentoring group, which led to the development of significant mentoring and networking relationships. We also recently held an event last week that was geared toward students in regards to mentoring. <clears throat> Pay equity was a great theme for us this last spring. We partnered with the Office of Equity and Inclusion and the Lieben Center for Women to host a few wonderful events acknowledging the pay group that we exist for women. We plan to coordinate events with our partners this spring as well. Please join us to learn more about pay equity issues and encourage students to attend this event. Our fall forum in October was a great success and we had more than 100 people participating and learning about the forum theme. Strength through change. We welcome back our alumni um, 
1983 award E. Uh, Mary Higgins, who provided our keynote address for the day. Following a half day of provincial development, we held discussion sessions which allowed attendees to share feedback and their experiences at Creighton. Two emerging themes from that discussion centered around, one, professional development and lack of knowledge about how to make use of time off, and two, various types of long-term leaves, including parental leave. <clears throat> the committee will be working closely with human resources in regards to these two items over the next year. The feedback from the forum will be presented to Father Lannon, and he was thrilled to hear how the day turned out. Father Lannon was a great supporter of our committee and the fall forum over the past few years. We thank him for our support and his leadership. Another event the committee has, ha has been happy to support is the Nebraska Women in Higher Education Leadership Conference. This year, we will be working in partnership with the Office of Academic Excellence and Assessment to ensure Creighton continues to have strong delegation. The call for the conference presentations will be out soon. And the event will take place on uh, Friday, September 18th at the Union College in Lincoln. As we plan for the spring semester and next year, we look forward to continuing to serve our university community and ensure that women have a strong presence on our campus. I would now like to rec re recognize our committee members who helped this committee with such success. Would all members of the Committee of Status for Women who are here please stand and be recognized. <clears throat> Thank you for your time and an effort in regards to this committee. Now I'd like to turn the program back to Katie I'm our committee chair to present the awards portion of our luncheon. Since the Mary Lucretia and Sarah Emily Creighton Award was first given in 1981, there have been 75 award recipients, including our three today. Previous honorees are listed in your program. All of our past honorees continue to inspire us with their achievements, character, and encouragement. May I ask the former recipients of the Mary Lucretia and Sarah Emily Creighton Award who are with us today to please stand so we can recognize you. There are three overarching criteria that are considered when reviewing nominations for this award. Nominees must have created an environment uh, supportive of the achievement of women, they must have encouraged women in the development of their talents, and they serve as role models of accomplishment for women. This year's honorees are tremendous examples of these award criteria. They each possess a lively and generous spirit, much like our founders. They help continue the legacy of Mary Lucretia and Sarah Emily. Each award recipient will be given a plaque and pin acknowledging this great honor. The pin displays an image of a horse and carriage symbolizing how Mary Lucretia rode through the streets of Omaha, caring for the poor. After each honoree is called forward, I invite them to share a few remarks. Our first recipient is Megan Bullard, a junior in the College of Arts and Sciences. Megan is being honored for how she serves as a role model for other female students, as well as how she mentors her peers. She is a servant leader, particularly within the inter-residence hall government, and her sorority, Delta, Delta, Delta. Like Mary Lucretia, Megan is service-oriented and has coordinated major service projects for the residence halls. She is not afraid to tackle tough projects and approaches such projects with optimism and excitement. To learn a little bit more about Megan, I'd like to invite Lucas Novotny, Assistant Director of Residence Life, to share a few words. Thank you, good afternoon. <clears throat> Megan, a junior elementary education major from Springfield, Missouri, has impressed so many in her short time at Creighton. As I considered Megan for this award, the characteristics that immediately came to mind were those of a strong leader, one who is incredibly gifted and able. 
However, in reviewing the nomination letters for Megan, the themes of passion and compassion became overwhelmingly clear. Megan has been involved in a variety of things on campus, from Greek life and InterVarsity to candlelight choir and residence life. However, it is her work in inner residence hall government, particularly with IRHG service initiatives, where Megan's light shines the brightest. As a student leader in Gallagher Hall, she spent time coordinating service experiences to the Charles E. Lakin Human Services Campus in Council Bluffs. Since then, Megan has climbed the ranks of IRHG, where she has held the position of Executive Director of Service, Faith, and Justice for the last two years. One of the paramount responsibilities of this role is to coordinate and provide oversight to the Residence Hall Community Partner Program. This is a very large endeavor, coordinating nine residential communities with a variety of students and nine very different community partners with, a, with vastly different needs and levels of involvement in, create, in the Creighton community. As one nominator wrote, Many have held this position in the past. Megan's work has not only been of the very highest quality, but it has been done with passion and concern for the neediest in our Omaha community. Another nominator spoke of her work by saying, she works to develop personal relationships with each campus partner and can speak passionately about their mission and how it connects to the values of Creighton University. She brings professionalism to her work that is admired by those around her. She is continuously working to improve the programs that IRHG provides to the campus by researching best practices and applying them to her work and her work with others. As many of you know, over the past year and a half, the landscape of higher education has started to shift. New and more stringent regulations are now in place for the ways in which we engage with children and vulnerable adults as we strive to serve them. Megan took on this difficult task of coordinating how we enact our mission in the Omaha community while observing these new regulations. One nominator wrote of Megan, Taking one of our signature programs from a period of uncertainty to one of continuity and strength was not only time consuming, but remarkably done in a grace-filled manner. Megan has been a consistent leader in, IRH, in the IRHG organization, but when reading these nominations letter, nomination letters, her work with the Community Partner Program seems to stand out as one of her pivotal accomplishments, both helping Creighton students and the Omaha community as a whole. Finally, one nominator summed up Megan best when, when commented, I commend Megan on so many levels, but her commitment to justice in a sensitive but wise way portrays the very best of a Creighton student. Please join me in welcoming Megan Bully. Well, trying to follow that will be slightly difficult. <laughs> Thank you so much, Lucas. Um, as Lucas said, my name is Megan Bullard. I'm a junior in the College of Arts and Sciences and an elementary education major. I am incredibly humbled and honored to be receiving this award today. And I would like to say thank you to a few of the people that have made this possible. First of all, thank you so much to the Committee on the Status of Women for this award. Thank you to those who thought so highly of me to nominate me. Thank you to my parents for always being there and for being here with me today. Thank you to my friends, professors, and advisors who have supported me and allowed me to get to this point. When I was told I would have a chance to make my remarks, I honestly wasn't sure what to say. The more I considered it though, it was only fitting to give a small glimpse into the situation that led me to be standing in front of you today. I wouldn't be here if it weren't for an incredibly unique set of circumstances most of which began when I entered my time here at Creighton. And it is that that I want to touch on, the Creighton experience I have had and how it has shaped me. I want to tell you a little bit about my Creighton. My Creighton is a place where gender doesn't have to be a concern because value is placed on work and not on statistics. Where students are driven to see their potential and push past it to achieve even more. Where advisors reach a new level of depth with their students and help create in them a passion they might not have even seen in themselves. My Creighton is a place where parents can send their students as children and take them back as leaders. Where voices are heard, controversies are raised, and the status quo is challenged because we as a student body will not go unheard. We are taught to question, we are taught to discern the greater good, and we will change our world as a result. At My Creighton, 
Students are stretched and challenged to answer their own questions, to find their own paths, and to set their own worlds on fire one day at a time. Where Jesuit values set an unbreakable foundation that permeate everything we do and forever change us to see the world from eyes outside of our own. At my Creighton, I am loved, I am welcomed, I am supported, I am challenged, and I am given every opportunity to be successful. And that is why I have the chance to stand and speak with you today. That is my Creighton, but I know that there is an opportunity for even more. There is an opportunity for even greater diversity as we move to show more of the world the value of our unique take on education. For increased student perspective, as we continue to mold and shape this university and truly make it our own. A chance for a renewed emphasis on the mission of our work and the need to share our gifts and talents with all members of our society as we live out our Creighton ideals. Here's a quote that I believe really helps to describe my time at Creighton. Tim Keller once said, to be loved but not known is comforting but superficial. To be known and not loved is our greatest fear. But to be fully known and truly loved, well, is a lot like being loved by God. It is what we need more than anything. It liberates us from pretense, humbles us out of our own self-righteousness, and fortifies us for any difficulty life can throw at us. But that is just my Creighton. That is one piece of a much larger puzzle that is our great university. I encourage you all to look at what makes up your experience. What makes Creighton yours? As I stand here, humbled to be given this award, I recognize the gifts and opportunities that have gotten me to this point. So for that, I say now and forevermore, thank you. Thank you, Megan. As a staff member here, I can say I'm truly proud that we have students like you on our campus. In her day, Sarah Emily Creighton provided much support for the St. Joseph's Hospital and the research and care provided at the institution. It is fitting that our next honoree is from the School of Medicine, since she continues to lead the legacy of research and care that Sarah Emily would have been fond of. Dr. Diane Cullen is a professor of biomedical sciences and is a well-funded and well-published researcher, serving as a role model for women in medicine and science. She has been intentional about stepping into leadership roles within a school that has, at times, been heavily led by men. She knows how important it is to work towards breaking the glass ceiling within medicine and science. Dr. Cullen is also a strong supporter of women's athletics at Creighton, having been a student athlete herself just as Title IX was being implemented in the 1970s. To learn more about Dr. Cullen, I invite Dr. Jennifer Tilleman from the Department of Pharmacy Practice to the podium. Dr. Tilleman. Thank you, Katie, and the Committee on the Status of Women for giving me this opportunity to say a few words about Dr. Diane Cullen. Dr. Cullen began her career at Creighton in 1989 as a postdoctoral fellow in the Osteoporosis Research Center studying bone histology. After the fellowship, she then became a faculty member in the School of Medicine and the Biomedical Sciences. Currently, Dr. Cullen teaches clinical anatomy to the uh, medicine students and is also an advisor for PhD students. In addition to her teaching responsibilities, Dr. Cullen has multiple publications and grants that she has accomplished. Through her work, Dr. Cullen is a role model and mentor for women interested in working in the sciences. One theme that emerged from Dr. Cullen's nom nominators was her quiet, unassuming manner of mentoring women in their journey in science. One nominator stated that Dr. Cullen not only works with the students to improve their science and laboratory skills, but also in preparing them to reach their goals. She offers her time and advice on interviewing skills, presentation technique, and how to be more marketable for schools of medicine or graduate schools. Another stated, Dr. Cullen does not talk the talk but rather walks the walk and quietly goes about her duties without fanfare. This to me is the real measure of a role model. By working in the trenches largely unnoticed and uncomplainingly, 
She is a woman who serves as the ultimate role model to her peers, particularly, particularly young women coming through the ranks. Another theme that surfaced was Dr. Cullen's support of women in athletics. Dr. Cullen played women's basketball as an undergraduate student at the State University of New York College at Brockport. She was inducted into their Athletic Hall of Fame in 1994. Dr. Cullen is an avid supporter of Creighton women's athletics, particularly women's volleyball and women's basketball. According to her nominators, Dr. Cullen relates many stories of how being a female athlete has changed since, since the implementation of Title IX. It is women like Dr. Cullen who paved the way for all female athletes. To conclude, I would like to quote one of her nominators. Dr. Cullen is an extremely insightful woman of faith whose presence and wisdom has made a difference to others as she too seeks to find the answers to life's questions that all of us as human beings ask and wonder about. Please join me in welcoming my friend and colleague, Dr. Diane Cullen. Well, I guess I don't have to say anything. Everybody already gave my speech for me. Um, but good afternoon, and let me first uh, congratulate Megan and Jim, uh, fellow awardees this year. I'd also like to welcome my uh, special friends and colleagues that are here to help me celebrate today. Um, I was speechless, but I managed to get a speech written here. Uh, but I'm very humbled to receive this award. Um, I looked at the list, and it's on the back of the menus, of all the previous awardees, and it's a very, very impressive list, and I'm honored uh, to be added to that list. Uh, first, I'd like to thank my uh, generous colleagues that nominated me, and I'd like to thank the Committee on the Status of Women for choosing me for this award. Um, it, it does leave me speechless. Um, second, I need to thank uh, the people that have loved me and mentored me and advised me and stood by me throughout the years. Uh, first, my parents, they shared their faith and values with me. They believed in me and encouraged me in uh, whatever I wanted to do. My husband, Patrick, many of you know him, uh, he expanded my horizons in many, many ways. But one of the things that one of the most important things he taught me was about God's love and um, how to share that love with other people. And so for that, I'm always thankful. Um, as been said, I've lived most of my life in a man's world, uh, from Catholic grammar school to athletics and then into science. Uh, I started out as a high school basketball player when we didn't have a court and we didn't have uniforms and we had pregnant basketballs. I was looking at your basketballs the other day, Jim, and I don't think the students today know what a pregnant basketball is, but <laughs> us oldies do. That's all we got from the men. Um, my high school basketball coach, Barb, is here with me today. Uh, she taught me so much. She was my first role model and uh, now she's one of my best friends. She taught me how to be a team player, how to work hard, to achieve success, and she taught me how to stand up for what's right. She showed me how to challenge the status quo for the uh, good of my students, and for that I'm ever grateful. Uh, I've stood up for women's athletics for uh, most of my life, and it amazes and pleases me to see how far women have come in the last 40 years. Although I haven't coached since I've been at Creighton, I've had the honor to work with some of the student athletes in my lab, and um, that's been very, very much fun. It gave me a chance to get to know them. Um, I came to Creighton, I was blessed to be invited to Creighton in 1989 as a postdoctoral fellow, and um, it was an incredible opportunity for me. For the past 18 years, I'd been at public universities, and I really looked forward to being at a place where I could speak openly about God and faith, and I really anticipated learning about my religion and my faith as an adult. Uh, little did I know about the Jesuits or contemplative prayer or the spiritual exercises and where they'd lead me. Uh, Father Gillick was uh, crucial in my spiritual development, uh, which is still ongoing. Um, 
Father Gillick was also crucial in getting my husband Patrick and I together. He was the only one who knew my name, and Pat couldn't understand how he knew who I, he was talking about when he asked for my name. Um, the Jesuits and their approach to prayer and their daily life has had a profound impact on me. Um, they've helped me to appreciate that the people and the interruptions in my day are at least as important and as the deadlines and the accomplishments uh, that come with teaching and research. And for that, I'm very grateful. Uh, for 20 years, I worked in the Osteoporosis Research Center doing full-time research. And during that time, um, I had the good fortune to work with around 40 different students. And I watched them complete projects, and I watched them present their data, and had the pleasure of watching them go on to medical school, graduate school, and I even had one go on to law school. Um, and it, it was a blessing to watch them grow and to experience Creighton through their eyes. Uh, I had a lot of dedicated technicians, and they were crucial not just to getting the work done, but to helping with the development of these students. Uh, we developed teams, and these teams challenged me constantly to listen, to be flexible, and learn how to adapt. Um, and so they were a big part of my formation. Now I'm in the biomedical sciences department and work with wonderful colleagues in the medical school. Um, today, my graduate students challenge me to expand my knowledge. Uh, the medical students constantly challenge my teaching abilities and my creativity. I thank my chairman, Dr. Yi, for all that he's done for me and my faculty colleagues that I work with. They're excellent mentors and role models for me. They listen to my crazy ideas and help me develop workable plans. So they're very good sounding boards. I thank the Office of Medical Education for all their support. They're eager and energetic and um, more than willing to help me try new things. I especially thank Alice Smith and Kate Pogge and um, Jackie Foster for all their support that makes uh, the teaching so easy in the medical school. Um, and daily, I try and thank Ann Bryan, who uh, is in the IACUC office, and her hard work gives me time enough to uh, listen to some of the faculty problems and actually try and facilitate their research amid all the rules and regulations that we have to live by. You've heard me use the word challenge a lot. Um, I'm a competitive person by nature, and I usually have high expectations for myself and for the people that I work with. Um, and sometimes that's challenging for these other people. But I suppose I'm a role model because I work hard towards my goals, and I try and help other people identify their goals and then achieve them. Um, I've had several excellent male mentors along the way, but it's difficult to find female mentors and role models uh, in science. And I've been really blessed here at Creighton to meet a lot of women who have been role models and who have supported me. Uh, they've encouraged me, they've uh, encouraged me to be myself, and they've shown me how to navigate the waters, and for that I'm very thankful. I try to pay it forward. I try to encourage and facilitate other people's uh, goals. I try and identify opportunities for people so that they can advance, and I try to help them find their way around hurdles when they're discouraged. I've always loved the chorus from one of the Beatles songs. Um, I won't sing it because I'm tone deaf, so I, I won't put you through that. But it's, oh, I get by with a little help from my friends. I get high with a little help from my friends. I'm going to try with a little help from my friends. And friends are so important to my life and to who I am. Sitting at my table are a few of my friends who have mentored and supported me throughout my life. Uh, scattered through the room are many more friends and colleagues who are important to my life daily here at Creighton. And then there's others that aren't here today. These friends have all held my hand when I needed support, and uh, now they're here to help me celebrate. I'm truly blessed, and I thank you. Thank you, Dr. Collin. We are blessed to have faculty like you on our campus. Our third and final recipient for today is James Flannery, the head coach for Creighton Women's Basketball. Coach Flannery reminds me a bit of what our founders, John and Edward Creighton, must have experienced being surrounded by strong women like Mary Lucretia and Sarah Emily. 
Coach Flannery is surrounded by strong women on a daily basis, and their interactions with him as their coach and mentor only makes them stronger and more independent. He is extremely supportive of the women he coaches and works with and has been a great mentor for many of them, both on and off the court. He knows the impact positive coaching and lifelong learning has on his players. To learn a bit more about Coach Flannery, I invite Carly Tritz, graduate assistant in athletics, to introduce Coach. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Carly Tritz. I am the graduate manager for the Creighton Women's Basketball Team. I recently graduated from here last May, and being a student athlete at Creighton has given me the opportunity to both play for and now work for James Flannery. Coach Flannery, affectionately known as Flan, has made a remarkable impact on my life. The prestigious, this prestigious award is given to those who create an environment that supports the achievements for women, those who encourage women to develop their talents, and those who have served as a role model of accomplishment for them. And Flan has done just that. Undoubtedly, he has made this impact on a great deal of lives, the, but the influence he has made on my life, both as a student athlete and a young professional, have been paralleled to few. His, his intentions are pure, his heart is full, and his passion is always strong. His love for the sport is matched with his love for the development of his staff members and his players, and is displayed through his tireless work ethic every day. Flan has dedicated a vast majority of his life to creating a program that is full of integrity and one that betters the community around it. By molding and influencing the lives of many young women, Coach Flannery is more than deserving of this distinguished award. One simple example can sum up the kind of person Coach Flannery is. Going into my senior season at Creighton, an ongoing knee injury required me to retire early. And having been on some sort of team my entire life, I feared that my days of belonging to something that were important to me were gone. Many discussions and conversations later, Flan had a decision to make. He was very understanding and he knew it was more important for me to walk out of here than to play my senior year. I cannot speak for all the head coaches in America, but I do know that not every one of them would have responded the same way he did. Instead of releasing me from the team, he wanted me to stay on the roster and be a part of the group. Not only was I welcomed to every practice, lift, film session, game, and road trip, but I was given special duties during the game, almost as serving as a bridge between the players and coaches. He made me feel important and wanted, regardless if I was the most valuable player or if I was the 13th name on the roster. And this is where I sparked my passion for coaching. I love the bond that teammates have with one another, but the one between a player and a coach is very unique. The way Coach Flanner treats his players is, this, is as if they are one of his own, and he feels this burning desire and burning need to do whatever he can to put them in the best, most successful position possible on and off the court. Following, following my graduation in May, he invited me to join his staff as a graduate manager. By doing this, he has given me the opportunity to see how much I truly want to be a coach and gain extremely valuable experience while getting my master's degree. Without the selfless acts that Flan has done for me, I would not have the platform I do to succeed, I would, not have the I would not be in the position I am today career-wise, and I would not have the same perspective on life, basketball, and relationships that I do. So for myself and every past, present, and future Creighton Women's Basketball player, thank you and welcome and congratulations on this award. See if I can get this mic up high enough. <laughs> Thank you, Carly. That was really well done, and I know you were super nervous about it, but you <laughs> were terrific. And thank you to Katie uh, and the Committee on the Status of Women. Uh, and uh, I'd also like to recognize and congratulate Megan and, and Diane. Um, I've known Diane for quite some time, and, and what Jenny said in the introduction about uh, Diane walking the walk without the fanfare couldn't have hit home any further. I, would, I had known Diane a long time, or quite a while, uh, before I knew what a big deal she is. Uh, and it's because she never, it's because, you know, she never touted that when, in any of my interactions with her. She was just passionate um, and committed to, to our sport and to advancing uh, women's athletics in a way that, uh, that few people have done. So I'm, I'm very privileged to, to be standing here today with you. So. Um, a couple things, I want to go just reference a couple things that kind of, that kind of drive me on a daily basis. One is, uh, is an article, it it's, doesn't come from the article, but it's, I think, uh, summed up by the, an article that I read about 10, 12 years ago that talked about 
the way that we talk about our work life. And, and uh, so th for those in my father's generation, my mother's generation, when you ask someone what they did for a living, they told you where they worked because they typically only worked in one or two jobs or one or two places their entire life. And somewhere along the way that changed. And uh, so when you ask somebody about their work life, they talked about what they did, not where they worked. And I think uh, as somebody who's, who went to school here and has been here as long as I have, I think that resonated a lot because it, it, it made me reflect on you know, both, <laughs> both where and what. And I think that's um, never probably been more in play than at a place like Creighton. As I, as I look out at that, that middle table and the, and the length of time that some of these people have been here, some of whom longer than me, and I always ask myself, why are they still here? <laughs> and, and then I answer, because Creighton's a great place. And uh, they deserve to be here, and, and Creighton deserves great people like them. And, uh, you know, so I, uh, you know, when you, when you get your hair cut like this, you can go anywhere to get your hair cut. So I made it, so I made it a point anytime I, anytime I sit in a chair and somebody asks me what I do for a living, I'm going to kind of alternate between I work at Creighton and I coach women's basketball because I think that's, that's the kind of balance that I want to walk. I want to, I want to be somebody who works at Creighton and I want to be somebody who coaches women's basketball. So bridging that generation, you know, between those who used to answer where they worked and those who now answer what I do. And I think uh, at Creighton that's really easy to do. And uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm looking dead at the, at the athletics table, but it's, it's not just the athletics table, it's all around the room. Those of you who've been here as long or longer than I and, and know what a special place this is. So that's, that's really important to me as I, as I work every day and, and, uh, and as I try to kind of reflect about what, what I'm going to be about every day. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, is a conversation, a couple conversations that I had uh, and it, it, it helps me to, to kind of reflect upon what the, what the mission of a coach is, what the mission of a, of a teacher is, especially at a place like Creighton. And my sister used to work in student services at a, at a rival Big East school. Uh, I won't say which one, but it's in, Indi in Indianapolis, and it's the only <laughs> non-Catholic school in the league. <laughs> But she, we had a conversation one time, and she said there was, you know, there was, there, was a, there was a confrontation at one of her meetings, and somebody stood up and said, because um, they were talking about, well, this wouldn't happen in the real world. This wouldn't happen in the real world. And somebody stood up and said, you know what? We're not the real world. We're higher education. And in higher education, we're supposed to treat people better and care about them more than they do out in the real world. And I thought about that, and I thought about, you know that if you if you can take that mindset to work every day how how important that would be especially when we get to you know impact you know 18 to 22 year olds the way that we do to treat them better and care about them more than they do out in the real world um, and and so I tie that in with a conversation I had with Dr. Fazell as who was my philosophy advisor um, and we were talking about the the I got to go to sports here but he was, he was talking about the influence that professional sport had on college sport and the, sh the showboating and the, the, the lack of sportsmanship and he was talking about how everything everything in, in, in the life outside of college oftentimes reflects back into college and, and uh, what we need to do and, and in this context it was what sport needed to do was to try to have what, what the college model is reflect onto professional sports okay so that we're not taking what what they do out there and bring it here, we're taking what we do here and bring it out there, or take it out there. And I think that, you know, to put those two conversations together, um, that's, that's really a lot of what drives me every day is to, is, is to feel like that, that I'm committed to getting our kids to be reflective about taking what we do 
and making that world out there just a little bit different because I think education is, we got to teach them how to fit in when they get out, okay, but we got to teach them to try to make what's out there a little bit better. And I think that's a challenge and that's, a, that's something that I try to think about and be reflective about and I fall short in a lot of ways every day, but I think it's, I think it's important and I think that's what drives me or to a large degree what drives me. Um, so, you know, how do you do that? I don't know. I mean, I, I think it's important that we, that we listen to our students Okay, that we that we watch them, that we observe them, that we see how they care for each other, and they laugh with each other, and they cry with each other, and they make the bad into the good. And and I think coaching female student athletes, I'm I'm very privileged to get to see that on a daily basis. I'm just really fortunate to get to see that. So when I see that, I still have to, you know, take my <laughs> take my duty seriously. And that duty is to, you know, I have to hold them accountable. Okay, I have to get them to believe that maybe they're a little bit more capable of doing something than they thought, that maybe they're better at things than they thought, um, but I got to make sure that they do it right, and that's, that's one of the great challenges is that when they are 19 or 20 or 21 and, and when you're coaching and winning is important, you have to get them to think that being close to right or close to good enough sometimes isn't good enough, and that's going to help them not just as basketball players, but when they get out away from away from basketball and away from Creighton, so that's those are things that uh, that that drive me daily. So thank you to to all my colleagues that uh, that who inspire me daily, with, both within the athletic department and around the university. I think there's a there's a there's a reason that most of us have been here that long, and that's because it's I think it's really easy to look around and and be inspired by the people alongside whom we work. And, and whether we say that or not on a daily basis, I know that, that uh, hopefully you're, you're feeling that same way that I feel daily. And then one final special, or two final special shout outs to the, to the two women in my life who, who you know, teach me what a strong woman is. And that's my wife, Emily, who puts up with the coaching lifestyle. Uh, <laughs> and that's not easy. Um, and uh, you know, cares about cares about me, but cares about what I do, and allows me to to live out my dream. And and uh, and and also, it's I got to tell you, it's great to have a woman's perspective. There are times when I come home and I vent, and I get a different perspective, and it's a it's a female perspective, and it's valuable. And our players should thank her <laughs> a lot. Carly, Riley, you guys should thank her a lot because. Sometimes she'll nod her head, but a lot of times you're like, Flan, you need to think about this and this. Okay, and, and so she's awesome there. And then I want to thank my mom, who uh, is, you know, when you're a coach, you get beat up. I mean, and, and, and I mean that, you know, awesome that the men got a win last night, but just you, you can see it in their body language. And we lost four in a row this month, and it, you get beat up. And I think the thing that, uh, that my mom has, has modeled incredibly well for me is is take the bad and make it good and uh, you know I just think as a coach there's there's no better recipe than that take the bad and make it good and she's had a lot of hardship in her life and and I just feel I've been blessed to have the opportunity to witness you know how she takes something bad and and finds a way to be thankful about the things that she has that are good and uh, that's pretty darn important so I thank all of you, and uh, <laughs> uh, very humbled, very humbled by this honor. It's, I, I've never won a coaching award, but I can tell you that uh, nothing that I would ever win in coaching will will match what this feels like. Thank you. Thank you, Coach. And I think that um, one of the reasons I think this is such a special event every year is because it does remind all of us how blessed. We are um, to work at a place like Creighton because of our founders. Um, and as we go through times of change and stress, that at the end of the day, there's a reason that so many of us stay so long, and that's because Creighton is truly special. I get to my right page here. All righty. Um, congratulations once again to each of our honorees, Megan, Coach, and Diane. You truly live the legacy of Mary Lucretia and Sarah Emily. I also thank the members of the awards subcommittee who made this such a wonderful event, especially the work of awards chair, 
Lindsay Johnson. Without their hard work and time, this luncheon would not have been so successful, so thank you. Um, at the end of the, um, after our, our benediction, if each of the honorees would kind of stick around this area, we'll have um, Phil take a few more photos um, of the three of you, and then if you want a photo with your families, we can certainly get that in as well, or um, with some special friends, especially with, with Coach and uh, some former players here for Diane. So, um, On behalf of the Committee on the Status of Women and the Planning Committee for this luncheon, thank you for taking time to, um, to join us to honor these, these are amazing community members today. To conclude our luncheon, I invite Morgan Pusick, third year pharmacy student and 2014 award honoree to offer our benediction. Following the benediction, we are adjourned. Good afternoon. This way. First, I'd like to thank the Committee on the Status of Women for inviting me to give the benediction today. We'll end today with a short prayer. Gracious God, we pray in gratitude this afternoon for the opportunity to gather as one community to celebrate the founding values of Creighton University. Let us celebrate the commitment and leadership of Megan, Diane, and Jim, who have strived to embody the mission of Creighton and have continued to keep this legacy alive. We pray for the inspiration of Mary Lucretia and Sarah Emily Creighton, whose lives continue to inspire the women and men of Creighton to advance and respond to the needs of the community. As we leave here today, let us keep in mind the passion of these awardees, and let me leave you with these words from J.K. Rowling. We do not need magic to transform our world. We carry all the power we need inside of ourselves already. Thank you. Thank you.